Hi everyone, um, this is our third day of reading Bad Blood together, um, and to yesterday's video, um, I talked a little bit about some of the things we read from page three and four, um, but there was some stuff that I did not think to talk to you about because sometimes I don't remember what exactly I want to talk about until I've done it a couple of times. Um, so as far as teaching it to your other classmates who I see in school, they got some more information than you did when it came to some of the things that we read, so I want to point that stuff out to you. Um, so I know we talked about the Norman Rockwell painting, or at least I hope we did. And I said that um, this image that he paints, which is the Norman Rockwell painting, and I, I think we talked about that, but if we didn't, this is what Norman Rockwell paints. So he was pretty popular um, in the 40s. Um, and then I don't remember, I don't really remember when he died, but he mostly painted like propaganda posters for the war. So, um, and propaganda, if you don't remember, is um, advertisements to inspire people to join the war and fight in it um, and stuff like that. Or just attribute something to the cause. So anyway, um, but, but a lot of what he painted is a take on the perfect American um, life, the perfect American family. So I want to focus on this pretty famous painting over here, um, the Giving Thanks painting by Norman Rockwell. And as you can see, it depicts the perfect American family. Um, we've got everybody gathered around the dining room table for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but the things that I want you to pay most attention to is the fact that they're white. And obviously they look like they're at least in an upper middle class family just based off of um, the china that they're using and everything like that. So, let's go back to that part where he talks about Norman Rockwell. So he says, Through her watery little eyes, I imagine seeing myself, a smallish brown-haired kid on his bike, heading down the driveway, towing his lawnmower on a rope. The image should be a Norman Rockwell painting. Summer Jaw would be the title. That, or Honest, Hardworking Young Man. So the reason this particular section here, the Honest, Hardworking Young Man, is ironic. And irony basically means um, you expect one thing to happen, but actually the complete opposite takes place. Um, anyway, this particular title is ironic to Jared because Jared is not the depiction of the perfect American family. First of all, Jared's not white. Um, and we kind of picked up on that a little bit where he talks about his family being immigrants from uh, moving to New York City. And then later in that same paragraph down here, it says her family was Eastern European as well. So again, his family is not white. They are immigrants, so they are not from the United States originally, which who really is, but regardless. Um, his skin is darker, his hair is darker, and his eyes are darker. He gives this exact description um, down here. Let's see. Um, just another family on East Maple Drive. And then he says, okay, slightly darker skinned and brown eyed rather than blue and a foot shorter than most of the corn fed Swedish and German stock around here. So we have a pretty clear picture of what Jared looks like. And it's definitely not this picture of the perfect American family according to Norman Rockwell. So that's ironic. And it's important that we talk about that because Jared already sticks out as it is. Not only is his family um, a bunch of thieves and con artists, they also don't necessarily fit the idea of a perfect American family, right? First of all, they're, they're immigrants, they're not white, and second of all, his parents don't have the, the stereotypical 9-to-5 job that most parents do to make their money the honest way, right? So that's important that I wanted to point out to you all, and I hope I'm not confusing you more by giving you that information, but it is important that you know and understand that. Um, what else? Let's go back to where he talks about this section here, being the description that he gives. So, um, with his face being, or his skin being darker, having brown hair instead of blue eyes, and then using this to pass as Italian. So, um, if we're in a predominantly white area, obviously, if you don't look white, you're going to stick out. That's just how it works, right? You're part of the minority. It's, it's obvious. So, in order to cover themselves, to not draw attention, because remember, Jared's dad, his whole thing is about making sure that they are as small a target as they can be. They don't want to be on anybody's radar right here. So, they're trying to blend in. And according to Jared, the best way to do that is to pass as Italian, which is why they 
Fake changed their name to Rigetti. Um, and according to Jared as well, his dad um, is a wholesaler for olive oil for pizza restaurants, um, which we read yesterday too. So he says that the reason they pass for Italian and that's okay that they're Italian in a Midwest community is because of Italian restaurants. So I know many of you have heard of Olive Garden. I'm sure many of you love Olive Garden, right? Midwesterners love their pasta. I know I do for sure. And um, just a heads up, folks, we are in the Midwest. So this is include, this includes people in Indiana, which we are. So um, he says that because they pass as Italian, they get a pass in the Midwest because they are associated with Italian restaurants. So that's how he's blending into this community, him and his family, so that they draw as little attention as possible to themselves, which is important, right? They don't want to get caught. So... Um, then we get some more background into the information, some information about his family, what his parents do for work, how they're also blending into the community. Um, but then we start to get into Mrs. Anderson too. Um, and that's where we picked up or left off, I'm sorry, from yesterday. So let's go ahead and continue reading. So, um, I'll start at the bottom of the last page. Next week, when I arrived to work, I knocked and knocked. It wasn't locked, so I stepped inside. Mrs. Anderson was in the parlor, just sitting at the, staring at the soldier on the wall. It's like she hadn't moved for an entire week. Hello? It's me, Jared, I called. She turned slowly, as if she had, didn't recognize me. I'm going to start in the garage today, I said cheerfully, scraping and painting. It's his birthday, she murmured. I stepped forward into the parlor entrance. For the first time, I got a good look at a, got a good look around. It was like a museum filled with antiques, valuable antiques. His birthday, I said. Gary, she said. She said to the wall, creepy like, as if she was talking to Gary. I looked closer to the shrine. At the shrine, there were several photos of Gary, one with helicopters and jungles in the background. Gary, my son, she murmured, as if calling out to him. They were there was a framed and yellowed newspaper clipping. Local Marine Garrett Anderson killed in Vietnam. The date was July sixteenth, nineteen sixty nine. I got it, her dead son. He would be fifty today, she whispered. Fifty years old. Isn't that amazing? Yes it is, I agreed, as I made a note of of the antique, some great old lamps, a lion's head, rocking chair, an actual windpipe wind up, I'm sorry, an actual wind up Victrola phonograph plus an 8-track tape deck and a shelf of clunky, oversized 8-track tapes. Bob Dylan, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, the birds, others with faded, daisy-like, and psychedelic designs. 8-tracks were worth a lot of money nowadays. People collected them. Mrs. Anderson blinked. She seemed surprised to see me standing there. I'm staring... I'm starting on the garage today, I said again loudly, cheerfully, as always. She didn't seem to hear me and turned back to look at the soldier on the wall, which gave me the opportunity, at last, to case the outbuildings that her spying on me. The garage was gloomy and full of spiders. It looked like a museum of rusty tools and shovels, not a hundred bucks worth of goods, so I slipped into the barn. Okay, so, um, we left off last reading, um, with Jared kind of getting a peek into the parlor, which we said is the, um, the sitting room where people entertain guests, and he saw that there was a shrine dedicated to a soldier, but we didn't know who the soldier was. So now we do, right? And it's really sad. It's Mrs. Anderson's son who died in the war, the, the Vietnam War to be exact. Um, so she has dedicated all of this space to memorialize her son, which is really sad. Um, so now Jared kind of gets an understanding, and I want you to notice something. He doesn't really pay attention to... Um, Mrs. Anderson or her grief, right? He's more focused on the antiques that are in the room, which is really, you know, disgusting in a way because this poor woman lost her son however many years ago, and he's not even, you know, sympathetic towards her. He's looking at what kind of stuff she's got in her, in her house. Um, I mean, and he is right, too, as far as, like, it being valuable. A lot of this old stuff, like the phonograph, that's, that's a, how they played music um, back in the day. Um, the tape deck, all of that stuff would be worth some money for sure. So, I mean, he, he has a reason for looking at it and ignoring Mrs. Anderson, but still, that's just, just shame, that's just some shady stuff. Um, okay, so, let's continue. The door creaked and pigeons clattered out of the hayloft. My heart pounded. The damned bird scared me. It took a while for my eyes to adjust to the light. 
which relieve which revealed a long row of rusty stanchions and a few old shovels and forks lying here and there. Zilch zero. So remember, stanchions are just those um, support beams to help keep structures uh, supported. Coming out of the barn, I looked around. The only other building was a hay shed, a metal roof supported by tall poles and open sides. I still don't know why I walked over to it, and certainly can't explain why I walked around back, behind it, the thief in me, I guess. A few bales had sagged and spilled out onto the ground. They were black and rotted. I kicked at them, I kicked at them. Just as I was about to give up on finding anything of value, I spotted a, some dif a different kind of green in the haystack, some kind of canvas or tarpaulin. I tugged loose a couple of, of bales and looked closer. The canvas mouse tune so badly it looked shot by a machine gun was draped over some kind of wooden frame. Beams, heavy ones, some kind of secret garage. I got down and dug out some bottom bales until I could slip underneath the canvas. Inside the canvas enclosure it was dark except for the bullet holes. Standing up I hit my head on something hard. Suddenly I had plenty of light, as in stars, like arching pinwheels of light. To steady myself, I reached out and felt a curvy, felt curving metal sticky with some kind of grease. Ah! I muttered and wiped my hand on, on the scratchy hay. I needed more light, so I crawled backward out of there and began to remove bale, more bale. Soon I had a double doorway sized area clear and found a corner of the canvas it was nailed to the wooden frame. I glanced down, seeing or hearing no one, and yanked up. With a ripping sound the canvas came loose, light spilled into the, the secret garage. Inside was a car, a small car covered in grease. A small squat car with lines and curves that anyone would instantly recognize an old Corvette. I sucked in a breath. It's not the dollar bill or the ten slot or even the whole wallet. Peeking around the hay shed or toward the house and seeing nothing of old lady Anderson, I stepped inside the secret garage and t tried the car door. Grease. Everything coated with grease, as if painted or broomed on. But the door opened. The little cockpit sat empty, its stick shift with its little round knob sticking upright between the seats. I slid over behind the wheel and my hand fell immediately to the stick shift. The car fit me like a glove. I wiped the dust from the dashboard gauges. The odometer read 562 miles. The bumpa bumpa of my heart echoed louder inside the dim cab, a classic Corvette with less than a thousand miles on it. The car would be worth 20 or 30 grand. Okay, so remember, the whole reason Jared has been helping Mrs. Anderson is to find the thing worth stealing, the thing that he's going to target her for. And before, she's always been watching him while he's been doing yard work. So he hasn't had any opportunities to really see if there was anything good. And besides all those antiques in the house, there really hasn't been anything. But now that Mrs. Anderson is so preoccupied with um, her son Gary's birthday, he was able to go and snoop around outside. And so he finds this amazing car, this old car. Um, if you don't know what a Corvette looks like, I highly suggest that you go and look it up. They're really cool looking. Um, and like he says, especially one that's older and has less than a thousand miles on it would definitely go for a lot of money. And this is awesome, right? Because remember, his dad has always said, shoot high, son, aim high. Don't go for just the wallet or anything else. Go for the big thing. And so he's found the big things. This is a big deal for Jared, okay? Um, so we're going to stop there for today. Thank you so much. Um, and we will talk about this some more in class.